de inicio a nuestras sesiones de esta mañana en esta sala referidas a diversos asuntos del Canadá. Saludamos la presencia de la delegación del Estado, encabezada por la señora embajadora y, y de la sociedad civil. Esta primera audiencia tiene por título eh, Denuncia de discriminación sexual en la ley indígena del Canadá ha sido solicitada por la, la the Canadian Feminist, Feminist Alliance for International Action. Eh, en la mesa me acompañan la comisionada Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitiño, segunda vicepresidenta y relatora para los derechos de la niñez. El comisionado James Cavalaro, relator para el Canadá. El comisionado Luis Ernesto Vargas entre otras cosas, relator para personas migrantes y la secretaria ejecutiva adjunta, Elizabeth Davi Merced. Eh, yo soy Francisco Iguren, presidente de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y relator para los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. En esta eh, audiencia, cada una de las partes tendrá una intervención inicial de hasta 15 minutos. Eh, yo iré anunciándoles con estos carteles cuando falten 5, 3 y 1 minuto y lo pondré allí. Luego de las intervenciones, primero de la sociedad civil y luego del Estado, eh, la comisionada, los comisionados haremos alguna intervención, preguntas o comentarios y luego el resto del tiempo ustedes tendrán cada uno una nueva intervención para comentar, responder o hacer las apreciaciones que eh, consideren más apropiadas. Entonces, sin más, vamos a dar inicio a la presentación a cargo de la sociedad civil, hasta por 15 minutos. Agradeceremos que la persona que encabeza la delegación o que hace uso de la palabra se identifique y se vayan presentando quienes sucesivamente hacen uso de la palabra o presente a los integrantes de su delegación para efectos del registro de la grabación. Adelante, por favor, hasta 15 minutos la sociedad civil. Uh, good morning. My name is Sharon McIver. I'm uh, a member of the, the Feminist Alliance for International Action. I have my, my colleague uh, Sheila Day, who is uh, the uh, chair of the Human Rights uh, Committee with the uh, Feminist Alliance for International Action. Dr. Pam Palmenter will introduce herself when she uh, has her input. Um, I'm uh, a Thompson and... No translation? Shut off my clock. Then. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> testing the sound system please if the interpretation team can translate so that we can see if the in interpretation devices are working on a b c d one two three four uh, ahora hablo en catalán para que haga la traducción al inglés está funcionando ojalá que esté funcionando para que podamos seguir está funcionando excelente maravilla Working, yes. 
Same channel, <laughs> and but she's yeah. Oh. <laughs> My name is Sharon McIver. I'm a Thompson Indian and a member of the Lower Nicola Indian Band in British Columbia. I'm a member of the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action. Along with the Native Women's Association of Canada, FAFIA appeared before this commission on the issues of murders and disappearances of Indigenous women in 2012 and 2013. This lead led to the commission's investigation and to the 2015 report on missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is an important spur to setting up the National Inquiry. We are here today because in your 2015 report, the Commission found that the long-standing sex discrimination in the Indian Act is one of the root causes of violence. Contrary to the Commission's recommendation, that long-standing discrimination is being continued, not eliminated. This sex discrimination has caused generations of Indigenous women to be disconnected from their community, stigmatized, treated first as non-persons, then as second-class citizens, lesser parents, less Indian, and a burden to their own community and broader society. We are here today because Canada, three years ago, one more time amended the Indian Act, and one more time, or three days ago, one more time amended the Indian Act and one more time did not remove the core sex discrimination. In 2017, it's too late and too dangerous for the discrimination to continue. In the Supreme Court of Canada last week, the Native Women's Association of Canada said, the continued existence of discrimination against women and their descendants in the Indian Act is the longest standing example of systemic discrimination in this country, and it is deliberate. It has created a cadre of second-class Indians, and even worse, it has expelled uncounted numbers from their families and communities of origin, casting them adrift from their very identity, making them vulnerable to abuse and violence. At every time a bill passed purporting to remediate the problem, but leaving the job undone, Canada's Parliament in effect, reaffirms and reasserts this discrimination. And, what it, and that is what Canada has done by passing Bill S-3. It has reaffirmed and reasserted discrimination. I am one of many Indigenous women affected by the ongoing uh, sex discrimination. Uh, Pam Palmenter and I will talk a little about our personal stories in order to illustrate how the discrimination plays out uh, in women's real lives. I'm the plaintiff in McIver versus Canada, a constitutional challenge to the sex discrimination in the Indian Act, which was decided in 2009 by the British Columbia Court of Appeal. My challenge resulted in one of Government of Canada's piecemeal reforms to the Indian Act. Bill C-3, which newly entitled about 45,000 women and their descendants to um, Indian status, and this was welcome. But Bill C-3 did not remove all sex discrimination, and I am discriminated against today because the government of Canada still refuses to entitle women and their descendants born prior to 1985 to full 61A status on the same footing as their male counterparts. My brother, who has the same parents as I do, has full 61A status, while I have partial 6-1-C status. 
This is only because I'm a woman and he's a man. Bill S3, which is the government of Canada's newest piecemeal reform, leaves this sex-based inequity in place. For the most part, from 1876 to 1985, there was a one-parent rule for transmitting status, and that parent was male. There was also a discriminatory marrying out provision. Indian women lost their status when they married a non-Indian, while Indian men who married non-Indians kept their status and endowed status on their non-Indian wives. In 1985, when Canada's new constitutional equality rights guarantee was about to become into force, the federal government introduced Bill C-31. It removed some of the sex discrimination, but did not remove the male-female hierarchy. Instead, Bill C-31 created two categories of status, category of 61A uh, for all of those, mostly male uh, Indians and their descendants who already had full status prior to 1985, and the lesser category of 61C for women whose status had been denied or whose status had been removed because of marriage to a non-Indian. The reinstatees were assigned a lesser category of status and a lesser ability to transmit their status. The children of Bill C-31 women were generally assigned 6-2 status, which is non-transmittable because they were understood to have only one Indian parent. The children of men, however, who conferred Indian status on their wives were understood to have two Indian parents, and those uh, children got full 61A status. For this sex-based hierarchy flows uh, from this sex-based hierarchy flows all the current discrimination problems. Since 1985, there have been a string of court cases. McIver, Matson, Gale, Desjardins, trying to unwind the impact of this entrenched sex discrimination. The government of Canada has responded to these cases by removing some discrimination identified by each litigant while leaving the core of the discrimination in place. And then to add a new twist, uh, in Bill C-3 in 2010, the Harper government introduced a provision that bars the descendants of women born before 1951 from eligibility for status. Bill S-3 acknowledges the remaining major chunks of sex discrimination by including provisions that would address them but it delays the implementation of these provisions until an unspecified date in the future. In other words, they have no effect. The bottom line is that Bill S3 will remedy the discrimination identified in the latest court case, the Desjardins case, by the, superior, or the Quebec uh, Superior Court, but will not eliminate the sex-based hierarchy uh, between Section 61A and 61C and will not eliminate the discrimination against descendants of Indian women born prior to 1951. Good morning. My name is Pam Pomoder. I'm from the Mi'kmaq Nation and Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick. I'm here as an impacted Indigenous woman, speaking for all of those who can't be here because they were murdered, missing, or uh, subjected to violence because of Canada's ongoing discrimination. But because of the ongoing and historic discrimination in the Indian Act, I was only registered as an Indian in 2010. However, I wasn't registered under the same category as any of my male relatives. Because of this, my children don't get to be registered simply because of the sex of my grandmother. In other words, had my grandmother been my grandfather, I would have been born with Indian status, so would my children, and we would all be members of our community. What Canada has done is denied my children the right to be part of my community. Instead, I grew up without Indian registration, and even now that I have Indian status, we're not always welcome as part of our community. But this has been the very objective of Canada's Indian Act legislation and Indian policy over time, and it remains so, to assimilate or eliminate, eliminate Indians so they can access our lands and resources. Part of the problem is that they haven't changed this policy. The Indian Act still has extinction dates for our First Nations. Whether it's scalping bounties, the forced sterilizations of our women, the theft of murder of our children in, in 
residential schools, or the crisis of murder to missing Indigenous women now, all stems from the ongoing discrimination in the Indian Act that tells us we are less worthy and we are less than human. And Canada's intentions in this regard are well documented in their own historical record. Their former superintendent of Indian Affairs said specifically about uh, excluding Indigenous women from the Indian Act, and I quote, it is in the interests of the department to sever her connection wholly with her community and the Indian mode of life. And that is what they continue to do under the Indian Act. Imagine my grandmother, who was born Mi'kmaq, raised with her family, learned all of her culture and traditions, became a, a, a famous healer of her people, only to be ousted from her community the day she married a non-Indian, because Canada said she couldn't be recognized as an Indigenous person anymore or live with her people. This didn't just impact her, however. It meant that my father, and myself and my grandchildren couldn't be a part of the community either and not be registered. This was devastating for my grandmother. And despite Sandra Lovelace's victory at the United Nation uh, on this issue, when Canada did remedy the Indian Act, they included a scarlet letter which my grandmother was forced to bear. And that scarlet letter is Canada registering Indigenous women under a different section of the Indian Act than men. This scarlet letter means that they are registered under 61C instead of 61A. They wore this scarlet letter as traitors, those who had married out, those who weren't welcome in their communities anymore, and they still bear this scarlet letter. And it is a form of discrimination that didn't exist in our communities. It is one created by Canada to keep Indigenous women separate from their communities. And that is part of the problem. This form of gender discrimination is not only historic, but it continues even after the passage of Bill S-3. Because there is no fixed date for our equality in the future, Canada expects us to rely on the promise of someday, maybe, possible future equality. And that is not equality, and it is not legally enforceable by any of the laws in our country. In preserving this gender discrimination, here's what Canada has done. It continues to send the message to not only our Indigenous communities, but to the public as a whole, that we are less than human, we are less deserving of basic rights, we are less Indian than our brothers, and we are fully deserving of both the discriminatory and horrific treatment that we have suffered as a result of being excluded Indigenous women. The impact of non-registration or registration under a lesser category has been devastating. This isn't just an administrative issue. It means that we are denied equal access to Indian status and band membership, citizenship in self-government arrangements, beneficiary status under our own treaties and land claims. We're denied a political voice in our communities. We can't even run or vote for leadership. And equally important is we're denied essential programs and services like housing, education, health care, which has led to numerous and, and the worst socioeconomic conditions in our country. We've also suffered a disproportionate loss of identity, language, and culture, and it is the root cause of murder to missing Indigenous women in Canada. Canada is literally killing our women and children by maintaining this ongoing discrimination. It is now a matter of life and death. And they have used consultations and the need to consult as an excuse not to take action when in fact they have now been engaged in consultations for over four decades. But here's what they can't consult out of. It is the law in Canada, in domestic, regional, and international law for gender equality, whether it's our Charter of Rights, our Canadian Human Rights Act, our Constitution Act, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or the American Declaration on the Rights of Man. It is very clear that we have gender equality rights that aren't being met. Canada simply has no legal authority to do this. There have been numerous reports and commissions and recommendations, both domestically and internationally, saying 
that gender discrimination against Indigenous women is a grave human rights violation. It is the cause of violence against Indigenous women, and it needs to be remedied. With thousands of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, those who are now the number one targets of traffickers, we need you to intervene. You have been so helpful in helping us move all of our human rights issues forward, and we're asking the three following things. To issue an urgent communique to Canada to comply with domestic, regional, and international human rights obligations by giving immediate effect to Bill S3 provisions, eliminating all gender discrimination, including the 6-1 ANC hierarchy and the pre-1951 cutoff. To monitor Canada's progress on implementation by requesting a detailed plan from Canada within a month, a teleconference within the parties on implementation within three months, and a working meeting with all the parties within five months to uh, establish that there has been implementation. And finally, we ask for a country visit to Canada uh, by yourselves to investigate the ongoing human rights abuses against Indigenous women and little girls, including Indian Act registration, the crisis of murder to missing, the theft of our kids in foster care, and the worsening socioeconomic conditions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the state. Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you very much. Commissioners, uh, members of civil society organization who are here from Canada and observers in the room, I'm pleased to be here on traditional Piscataway territory. My name is Jennifer Lowden, and I am Canada's permanent representative to the OAS. I'd like to thank the Commission on Human Rights for the invitation to make a statement here during today's session, and I would like to thank Dr. Pometer, Sharon McIver, and Ms. Sheila Day for their presence here today as well as the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action for requesting this hearing. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on the most recent developments related to Canada's commitment to the removal of all sex-based inequities from the Indian Act. I want to start by paying tribute to the courageous women across the room from me, and also to the many courageous First Nation individuals who have tirelessly brought the issue of sex-based discrimination within the Indian Act to light. Women like Jeanette Corbet-Laval, Senator Lovelace, Sharon McIver. I would also like to recognize Stéphane Deschenoux, Suzanne Yantha, and Tammy Yantha, those courageous women who fought in courts to eliminate any of the discriminatory treatments of tens of thousands of people. And I also, in particular, want to underline our commitment uh, to continuing to address this issue and our recognition of the courage that it takes to bring your personal stories forward. This is about real lives and real people and the inalienable right to define yourselves and to identify yourselves. The Canadian government has made commitments on several fronts, including, including the elimination of discrimination against women. The government has committed to a renewed relationship with Indigenous people and to advancing the journey of reconciliation. Canada has fully endorsed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and has begun a review of relevant federal laws policies and operational practices to ensure me, that Canada is adhering to international human rights standards, including the United Nation, Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In August of 2015, the Quebec Superior Court ruled in the Deschenaux Canada decision that key Indian registration provisions under the Indian Act contravene the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by perpetuating a differential treatment in entitlement to Indian registration between Indian women and Indian men and their respective descendants. This decision dealt with specific situations of residual sex-based inequalities affecting cousins and siblings, which highlighted inequalities that were missed in previous amendments of the Indian Act. To that end, Bill S-3, an act to amend the Indian Act in response to the Superior Court of Quebec's decision in Deschenaux versus Canada was introduced on October 25, 2016, to address sex-based inequities found in the Indian Act, in line with the additional decision. Bill S-3 intends to eliminate sex-based discrimination and then conduct meaningful consultations on broader issues related to Indian registration, band membership, and First Nations citizenship, in line with the government's promise that broad reforms would not be made without consultation. 
During parliamentary deliberations on Bill S-3, witnesses and parliamentarians expressed concern about whether Bill S-3 addressed all possible situations of sex-based inequalities, as well as concerns regarding the level of engagement with First Nations and impacted individuals. A wide range of issues were highlighted, some within the scope of Bill S-3 and others falling outside. What has been evident from these discussions is that people are very passionate and committed to addressing the issues of inequity in Indian registration. At the same time, it was highlighted that jurisdiction over Indian registration, citizenship, and band membership should not remain under the government's control. During the study of the bill, the government welcomed a number of important improvements to address a range of issues beyond those raised by the court in the Dishino case. The bill now addresses the issue of unstated, unknown parentage and will enshrine into legislation additional procedural protections. It will also allow the Indian Registrar to consider various forms of evidence to establish eligibility for Indian registration in situations where an applicant's parent, grandparent, or other ancestor is unknown or unstated. The government will also be required to report back to Parliament on a number of occasions on the design and progress of the consultation and on the implementation of the bill. In response to concerns raised by witnesses and the Senate that Bill S-3 did not go far enough to remove all sex-based inequalities, the government introduced a further amendment to Bill S-3. Under this amendment, the 1951 cutoff from the Indian Act will be removed to extend entitlement to Indian status under subsection 6.1 to all descendants born prior to April 17, 1985 or of a marriage prior to that date, of women who were removed from band lists or not considered Indians because of their marriage to a non-Indian man. This amendment will cover circumstances prior to 1951 and remedy inequities back to the 1869 Gradual Enfranchisement Act. This change is subject to a delayed coming into force to allow for proper consultation with First Nations on how best to implement the amendment as part of Canada's commitment to a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nations. The remaining sections of Bill S-3 will be brought into force upon royal assent to ensure that justice is rendered to the estimated 35,000 individuals impacted by the Deschanel decision. I'm very pleased to inform that on December 4, 2017, a motion was adopted by the House of Commons to adopt the amendments to Bill S-3 proposed by the Senate. The bill will receive royal assent on a date yet to be determined. Passing this bill is no small accomplishment. This is a step forward and a historic moment that brings us one more step toward full gender parity within the Indian Act. We've heard today that some concerns remain, but that sex discrimination remains in the Indian Act. The intention of the Canadian government in response to the Deschanel decision was and still is to move into a comprehensive collaborative process where we will be consulting with First Nations and Indigenous groups on the broader issues around Indian registration, band membership, and First Nations citizenship. As mentioned, the government is committed to consulting with First Nations on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. This is essential to the renewal of the relationship between the Crown and First Nations. It is fundamental to advancing reconciliation, which is founded on trust and respect for rights. This is especially important in matters relating to identity and citizenship. Since 1869, Canadian law has provided the federal government with the authority to determine who is and who is not an Indian. As we pursue efforts to devolve this authority to First Nations themselves, it is vital that these issues be determined in partnership and through consultation. We need to work together to ensure the impact of such devolution are identified and addressed. In addition to the government's commitment to move forward with consultation on the elimination of the 1951 cutoff, we have legislation that places a legal obligation on the government to move forward with consultations aimed at determining how best to eliminate the 1951 cutoff. In other words, with the passage of Bill S-3, the 1951 cutoff will be eliminated. The question is how that will be accomplished. What is clear is that it is not for the federal government to dictate what the change must look like, but for Indigenous peoples to set the path forward, and for the federal government to act as a partner in operationalizing and supporting that path as appropriate. We are committed to working with First Nations to ensure that we get this right. We should not and will not take unilateral action that could lead to significant and lasting impacts on Indigenous peoples. The government has a constitutional obligation in relation to this bill. 
It has an obligation to comply with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms with regard to sex discrimination. The government is also committed to consulting with indigenous peoples, and this consultation is critical for effective reforms. To ignore either of these commitments made would be to continue the paternalistic and colonial mentality that has been at the heart of the problems contained within the Indian, Indian Act itself. As adopted by Parliament, Bill S-3 will ensure the government proceeds in a way that respects its constitutional obligations and respects First Nations. The government is working in partnership with First Nations to design the consultation process that we expect to launch in April of 2018. This will be a process where the voices of impacted peoples will be represented at the table. This consultation process will move toward Indian registration, band membership, and First Nations citizenship reform in a comprehensive way. This is an opportunity to participate and to precipitate conversations on a broader and much needed reform in line with the government's reconciliation agenda and objectives to change the relationship with indigenous peoples and support self-determination. This is a national exercise to secure cultural identity and contribute to improving the outcomes of indigenous peoples and bringing about healthier communities. It's a significant step towards sorting out the complex issues that have been ongoing for over 150 years. To quote Canada's Minister of Justice, the Honourable Judy wilson Raybould, to tell the story of Canada truthfully, as we must, in addition to all of our achievements, we have to acknowledge a darker chapter in our history, that being the impact of colonialization, as well as the resilience of generations of Indigenous peoples seeking justice to ensure the survival of their cultures and their languages and their ways of life. How do we support the rebuilding of Indigenous nations as part of Canada? First, we must confront the reality of our history, something which the report of the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission established to address the legacy of residential schools is helping us to do. Colonial legislation, such as the Indian Act, however, continues to govern the lives of many indigenous peoples and communities across the country. Reconciliation is no easy task, especially when existing laws, policies, and practices are grounded in colonial ways that go back 150 years. This is why the government is taking a systematic and coherent approach to this work. To inaugurate this shift in approach, the government endorsed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples without qualification. A working group of government ministers has started working with Indigenous Peoples to decolonize federal laws, policies, and operational practices, and to ensure that all aspects of Canada's relationship with Indigenous Peoples becomes rooted in recognition of rights. The working group's mandate is nothing short of transformative. Amongst many important standards affirmed in the UN DRIP is the idea of self-determination. At its core, self-determination means that indigenous peoples set the direction for their own future, including the self-governing institutions they will use to serve and meet the aspirations of their citizens. The consultations to be held in partnership with First Nations on broader issues related to Indian registration, band membership, and First Nations citizenship will be a significant step toward broader reform of the Indian Act. It will also inform how First Nations could be supported in their efforts toward self-determination. In closing, let me leave you with this thought. Today, in looking to renew the nation-to-nation, -nation, Inuit crown, and government-to-government -government relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples, we are correcting past mistakes and working to modernize our institutional structure and governance so that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples can build capacity that supports the implementation of their vision of self-determination. We are looking forward to the consultation process, which will help build a better future for Indigenous peoples within an even more inclusive and just Canada, and I would argue a better future for Canada as a whole, as we are not Canadians and Indigenous people. We are together the citizens of Canada. I would also like to thank the women sitting across from me once again who have consistently brought these issues forward, sought justice, and continued the conversation in a way that moves us toward the kind of future that we all want. I can't thank them enough for continuing to do this as a Canadian very aware of our history and very hopeful of a better future. We look forward to the consultation process in which we help to build a better future for Indigenous peoples within an even more inclusive and just Canada in order to make the next 150 years of Canadian history better for us all. We look forward to the committee's views, and we do hope that any report that's produced will continue to move this conversation forward. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señora embajadora. Eh, ahora la comisión.
intervendrá con algunos comentarios. En primer lugar, el comisionado James Cavallaro, relator para Canadá. Muchas gracias, señor eh, presidente. Uh, I'll speak in English. Uh, so, let me thank uh, all present uh, for very thoughtful uh, presentations of the issues, uh, as well as for what I uh, believe is a collective commitment uh, to gender equality and to moving as quickly as possible towards gender equality in the Indian Act and uh, in the broader issues that are, as has been documented and has been demonstrated here by our own reports, a result of the historical uh, inequities and inequality in the Indian Act. So I'm trying to wrap my head around what the tensions are. Uh, in, in S3, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's the idea of, a, of, of 6-1-A all the way, right? Like, and I, if I understand it correctly, that, that's the core demand of the three petitioners and the organizations that you represent. Is, is that right? Or can I, maybe I can, if I can ask that question and then continue, uh, Mr. Yeah. President? Thank you. There's a question there, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, so the core issue is the 61A, 61C hierarchy between men and women, and also the pre-1951 cutoff, where there's no remedy for those born prior to 1951, just an arbitrary date. So there's the pre-1951 cutoff and the 61A, 61A, 61C distinction. So 61A all, all the way, as in everyone, women and men both, should have 61A status and, and rights that flow from that. And the uh, 1951 cutoff date is arbitrary and should be removed. And what I'm trying to wrap my head around from this side is, I think I hear a commitment from you, Ambassador Lawton, and, this, and, and the government of Canada to move in that direction. But if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you prefer a, a consultation process to that would lead ideally to that outcome. And so if this is the tension, tell me if I'm wrong, what if there's a consultation process that doesn't lead to that outcome? Is that, is that, the, is that the concern? Or is the concern there doesn't need to be an, a consultation process because we don't consult on individuals' rights? So, the, the, so there's my question to both sides. Is the idea, is the position here, is the position here that we don't have to consult? Gender equality, full stop, implement no need to consult, and as a position here, no, because we have a nation-to-nation -nation status, we have to consult, and then we'll see what the consultation brings. That's what's not clear to me, and I apologize if it's clear to everyone else in the room. So that's, that would be the, uh, the question. No sé si comparten esa preocupación. ¿Dónde está la tensión? I'm sorry, where is the tension? And finally, I will say, although my period on the commission will end in a matter of weeks, I am certain uh, that my uh, colleagues who will continue uh, would be most interested and committed to being involved in, a, in however the Commission can be involved in trying to move this as quickly as possible towards a resolution consistent with the principle of gender equality, consistent with the norms of the inter-American system, consistent with international human rights law. In the three weeks that, uh, that I have, I'm also happy. Boy, I'd love to do, uh, resolve this by the end of the year. But if it goes on until uh, uh, early 2018, my colleagues, I think, will be very happy to uh, continue uh, uh, with, that, with that process. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, James. We will do it. Me cambias el nombre. Muy buenos días. Sí. A todas, mi complacencia de poder tener esta oportunidad de escuchar a la sociedad civil, a la representación de la mujer indígena canadiense, directamente sus vivencias, pero también a la representación del Estado que eh, compartiendo el, el, la opinión de, de mi colega James, eh, efectivamente es, eh, encuentro que hay una eh, disposición para, para eh, superar eh, este, esta realidad de discriminación que me parece tan, tan difícil de, de procesar 
en 2017 con un proceso de, de revisión que ha tenido esta normativa eh, por, mucho, por mucho tiempo. Eh, quería hacer una, una precisión eh, de, de lo que representa mi, mi preocupación para por qué no se ha podido corregir esta, eh, esta discriminación eh, abierta, completa. Eh, se ha señalado que, que sí, Canadá cumple la Carta de los Derechos de Naciones Unidas, especialmente en los derechos de, de, de pueblos indígenas, eh, la propia Carta de, 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 de Canadá eh, de Derechos, pero eh, la embajadora presentó un punto eh, que, que me parece que es como el, el nuclear. Eh, se trata de un compromiso colectivo del, de la nación, del país. Es un ejercicio nacional. Pero esta consulta, que es con los pueblos indígenas, debo entender que son los hombres indígenas que se oponen a que se dé este, este reconocimiento, que es eh, bueno este concepto de, de la línea de la paternidad masculina y son solo los hombres los que pueden transmitir eh, descendencia. Entonces, eh, si, si, si pensamos que se trata de un ejercicio nacional, el cumplimiento de los derechos, en la no discriminación... Eh, no, no estaría en, en un tema de discusión. ¿Por, por qué eh, efectivamente este proceso no se ha alcanzado? Y, y puntualmente el impacto que esto tiene en la vida de las niñas indígenas. Yo tuve oportunidad de estar eh, eh, hace años atrás en el primer congreso mundial contra la explotación sexual y comercial. Y eh, la presentación que se dio allí de las mujeres indígenas era esto particularmente. Entonces, recordar esa, esa preocupación que desde 1996 en particular, que fue este congreso, eh, y que hoy estaríamos eh, viviendo esta misma circunstancia como lo ha dicho el informe de la Comisión, con un número eh, importante de niñas, adolescentes, desaparecidas y, y, y muertas, ¿no? Un poco la preocupación nuestra. Gracias, Esmeralda. Comisionado Vargas. Presidente, muchas gracias y buenos días a todas y a todos. Felicito también a las activistas que se nos han presentado el día de hoy y al Estado por su disposición para solucionar el, el tema. Yo es la primera vez que veo la paradoja de que eh, quien asume la posición de sociedad dice que el Estado se está eh, escudando en la consulta para no solucionar el problema, cuando siempre hemos visto que la consulta es un mecanismo de protección esencial y más a las comunidades tribales o indígenas. Pero eh, entiendo mm, también la dificultad que ha planteado el gobierno a través de la señora embajadora. Eh, la comisión cumple un papel fundamentalmente de mediador y creo que vamos a seguir, como dijo eh, Jim Cavallaro, el compromiso de seguir intermediando para que la solución sea pronta y sea eficaz. Me agradaría muchísimo que los vínculos entre sociedad y eh, Estado se estrechen sean mucho más cercanos porque yo veía ahora que mientras la embajadora Lotan hacía una, eh, una muestra de plena disposición del Estado para solucionar el problema, veía eh, que las eh, señoras de la sociedad civil miraban como con escepticismo, no la miraban siquiera y yo eh, me, me, me preocupó eso, ver que... que había una magnífica disposición de parte de, del, del gobierno y sería muy bueno que ustedes se acercaran, se acerquen a él y tengan confianza. Yo particularmente tengo fe en que, en que cuando un Estado se expresa a través de su representante, 
normalmente es porque van a solucionar las situaciones. Entonces yo creo que es bueno que tengamos también esa confianza legítima de parte de, de la sociedad y que sean muy, muy buenos los vínculos que se estrechen a partir del día de hoy. Gracias. Elizabeth. It's a very brief follow-up question along the same line as the comments of the commissioners. And it's in the sense that the Commission looks at the question of prior consultation, of consultation with First Nations in general, and usually does see it as a positive thing. But I think the question in, in the particular instance is, as I understand it, the government indicates that it is constitutionally required to have some kind of consultation process about implementation. But the question I think one would have is, how would that process be able to take into account that this is a question of historical discrimination based on sex, how could the consultation be set up in a way that takes into account that reality, if I'm being clear? If it's just with the leadership as the leadership exists, does that take into account the historical context of discrimination, and what are the alternatives to that? Thank you, Mr. President. Gracias, Elizabeth. Eh, como empezamos un poquito tarde y tuvimos algunos inconvenientes, eh, cada una de las partes tendrá ahora cinco minutos para poder dar respuesta o comentar las intervenciones que se han presentado. Seguiremos, culminada la audiencia, recibiendo por escrito cualquier otra información que tengan a bien darnos para que podamos realizar el seguimiento de este tema. Entonces, otorgaría la palabra hasta por cinco minutos a, primero a los representantes, las representantes de la sociedad civil. Just very quickly, uh, we just give you, we gave you a little bit of history on the changes to the Indian Act. And in 1985, when they did the major changes, uh, and we noted that there were ongoing discrimination, they said that they, the government said, we, we need to consult, and they did consult. But, but, and the majority of the people said we, that we agree with equality, but they didn't do anything. In 2010, when they were forced under the McIver Amendment, to uh, change the law. They did a minor change and they said, well, to get rid of it all, we need to consult. And they did consult. And they heard from, from the majority that uh, e uh, equality is essential and they didn't do anything. And so when we moved to do S3 and they just did the minor changes uh, and those of us that have been interested did a lot of, of advocating and lobbying and convinced the Senate to change the law uh, before it passed out of the Senate uh, to make sure that full equality was there. And the Senate did that. And it went to the uh, House of Commons, and the House of Commons stripped out all of the amendments. And they um, then went back to, we need to consult. And so then when it uh, passed the House of Commons, came back to the Senate, they amended uh, the bill to put in that they uh, are going to give themselves time to consult. And so for those of us that have been doing this for a long time, uh, the trust isn't there to say that if you will have equality sometime in the future, because we've been hearing that for a long time. And I guess the, the basic uh, position of those of us who are being discriminated against us and our children, uh, our basic position is, is you cannot consult on basic human rights. You cannot ask anybody, is it okay if we, we uh, continue to discriminate or continue to violate? And so that is not a position for consultation. You know, funding for communities, what they're going to do around the influx of, of people on their ban rolls, all of that, but not whether or not should we continue to discriminate? Yeah. And I'd like to, to respond. Uh, of course, I, I agree with Sharon as well, and I'll, I'll deal with all of these questions. You know, the issue of consultation or don't consult, consult on human rights. We're talking about a federal law that's been in place for well over 100 years. Canada's laws have always said you cannot discriminate against women. It's very basic, it, and it's an easy fix. It can literally be fixed right now. There is no reason for this delay. Um, and if you, even if you were going to take consultation into effect, 
It's been four decades of consultations. They consulted on Deschanel already. They've had two extensions from the court. They certainly have no excuse to delay our rights. Canadian women got equality in 1982 with the Charter. Indian women are being told, well, wait until we find when it's more convenient. Um, the question on why is it not possible to correct, it so is. <laughs> Fix the date. They're saying wait to an unfixed date, which is not legally enforceable. We have to hope that the political will is there, and it's never been there. And uh, government officials, when we did meet with them, told us, quote unquote, never, never are we going to get pre-1951 dealt with, never. So we know what the real intentions are. If they had any intention of doing this, the bill would say the, the equality is there. Um, on the uh, on the other issue around uh, consultations and um, what Canada uses consultations for, the reason why it's so important to them is because they use this to divide Indian women from communities. And what you should know is that the, the government did extensive studies on Bill S3 in the House and in the Senate. And there was, for the first time in history, complete consensus on we we have to deal with all these other issues. Yes, let's consult on other issues. But when it comes to gender equality, everyone's on side. The males, the male organizations, all of the organizations that testified, we're talking about a, a historic consensus. And, and well, it should be. We shouldn't be talking about this in 2017. And what they've done in this consultation process is fear monger with our communities to try to create discontent. They've said millions, literally two million people will be added to your First Nations. You're, you will be overwhelmed. You won't be able to afford it. But Canada's own parliamentary budget officer, who is independent, said the number's more like 270. And essentially, you need to look at it in the reverse. If it's going to cost you 400 million a year for Indigenous women, this is what you have been denying them since 1982, literally billions of dollars in basics like food, water, and housing. How can we allow Canada an unfixed date? It could be 20 years before they do this. We deserve better than that. We have equality rights in this world, in our country, and we should have it now. Muchas gracias. La intervención ahora del Estado. Thank you very much. Um, and again, all I can say is, uh, and speaking very personally, as someone who's been involved in gender equality issues my whole life and my whole career, uh, I take the point that gender equality was granted to Canadian women in 1982, but we all know, the six of us, and I'd like to point that out, the six of us, that gender equality isn't something that a law grants, that this is a process of adaptation, of implementation, of moving forward and evolution. I'd also like to put on the table the, the idea of the word consultation. Uh, 150 years um, of history that no one denies, uh, that is, I think, a black mark on Canadian history, something that the government is committed to reversing and to addressing. Uh, it's part of what, the, and consultations that have happened over decades and decades have done so in particular contexts. My own um, commitment as a member of a government that has, a, has changed its relationship with Indigenous people, is committed to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and is working to a different reality, is that consultations in this environment are not the same thing as consultations that have happened, and we're all aware, we all know how those ones happen, how what, what happens is you, you're presented with a document and we're consulting, we're going to tell you what we're going to do. We're not actually here to ask you what you think. We're hoping that we're moving into an environment where consultation means something very different. And, and again, the complexity is there, pardon me, the complexities there are obvious. Who's involved, who participates, who speaks on behalf of whom, and how are they run? I'm, I'm very disappointed um, and confused to hear comments from across the table like 1951 will never happen. I'd be curious to know where that came from, who, who said that, and that needs to be followed up on, and, and I'd love to hear about this after. I can tell you that the cutoff date will be eliminated. The question is how do we accomplish it? What we're talking about now in consultations is implementation. How do we go about doing this? I'm here before you today to reassert this government's firm, deeply held commitment to human rights, to gender rights, and to working to a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship with indigenous peoples. Um, if I were sitting on the other side of the table, I think I would feel a healthy dose of skepticism. I think I would feel a healthy dose of frustration. 
I'm hoping that we've come to a, a place in the evolution of human rights and of the relationship between Indigenous people in Canada where those emotions, where those real feelings and where those real preoccupations are part of what drives us to the table and part of what we want to get past. We need a future that's inclusive and that takes into account uh, and moves away from the dark history that we're trying to overturn. I, I can also, the questions that came from the commissioners, and there were many, and one in particular talked about Indigenous uh, males and their role in this. I want to make sure we clarify that. The Government of Canada and the elements in the Indian Act did not come from Indigenous communities, did not come from Indigenous males. We will return in writing with responses to a few of the questions that were posed and clarify that. Um, thank you very much for the time that we've had this morning to talk about these issues. It's a work in progress, as it has been for decades. I hope we're moving to a better place, and I hope that the commitment of the Government of Canada is realized as quickly as possible. Thank you very much to those who continue to bring this forward. We remain uh, open to continuing uh, in exchanges of information to try to get to a place where we resolve these, and in particular, the MacGyver Amendment. Uh, I think will it started us along a different road, and I hope that we continue to build on the progress that we've made and we get to a place of gender equality for all Canadian men and women, regardless of uh, their birth, who they married, who their children are, and who their grandparents are. We all have a right to our own identity and a right to self-determination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador. If I may, in in the follow-up and response, if I could request on behalf of the Commission, uh, if the State uh, would be able to respond to the specific requests raised by the petitioners for uh, uh, working meetings, timetable, I, I'm paraphrasing incorrectly, but there were f uh, very concrete requests, and if we can make them ours, in the sense that we would love to hear the position of the Government of Canada on those specific requests, whether that will be possible and whether we would be able to move forward. And, and again, the Commission, for the to, for the rest of 2017, this commissioner, but beyond that, uh, the commission is uh, very interested in being engaged in, in helping to move this uh, process forward as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Gracias, Jim. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a la representación de la sociedad civil y a la representación del Estado eh, por esta interesante audiencia. Ojalá que pronto estos asuntos legales sean superados, porque si hay la voluntad para hacerlo, se puede hacer. Eh, Con ello concluimos esta audiencia y en nueve minutos aproximadamente iniciaremos la siguiente. Muchas gracias.